let's sing that chorus one final time. And once again I look upon the cross where you died. I am humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I Please be seated. You may well have come to Spring Harvest under duress. She may have bribed you to come. And you're sitting in this theatre tonight and you've already decided it was a wrong decision. If you're feeling most uncomfortable and ill at ease and not at home, a special welcome to Spring Harvest from all of us to you. We want you to be at home. This is your event. And if when people stand around you, you want to sit, that's fine. If you're in a main seminar and somebody says, let's break into groups of three or four, if you'd rather sit there and read the Daily Mail, that's fine by us. I promise you, it's your event. We want you to feel at home. And uh, while you're not looking, maybe, um, when you least expect it, God may well speak to you and help you in a way that you never dreamt was possible. And those of you for whom this form of worship or dance or mime or the conduct of people around you is strange, stick with it, persevere. By the end of the week, you may come to like it. At the moment, you're convinced you won't, but be open and be ready. Change is always painful. I remember one old lady saying to me, as she discussed the changes that were going on, she said, she said, it's not easy, but I am enjoying it. I thought, that's not a bad maxim. Recognizing that change is difficult, but being open for any new thing that God may have for you tonight. Now, if you have a Bible, I'd love you to turn to the book of Ephesians. That's the basis of every one of the sermons that you'll hear in the gaiety this week, here in all the venues. The basis is the book of Ephesians, the Bible reading, it's the Sermon on the Mount, the main seminars, the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20. So you may want to bring your Bibles in the evening. You'd be surprised how many speakers will refer to the passage, and you'll be glad that you've got it in front of you. Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm reading the first 10 verses. By the way, my name is Lyndon, Lyndon Bowring. I'm just, you say, you, you look like you're stalling for time, Lyndon. I am. There are some people still trying to find Ephesians. It's in the New Testament. Sorry, yes, sorry. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. 
for it's by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves it's the gift of God not by works so that no one can boast for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do may God bless his unchanging world word quite often in spring harvest we invite a guest to come and preach either from the UK or from overseas somebody who Christians have hardly ever heard of we invite these relatively unknown people who have great ministries powerful preaching ministries and they come and people wonder exactly what are they going to be like well tonight's speaker is not like that our speaker tonight is Steve Chalk Steve yes That's Steve's auntie and uncle. <laughs> and Steve is an ordained Baptist minister. He founded a ministry called Oasis. It's a youth training ministry, one of the fastest growing Christian youth ministries of its time, training young people, but giving them hands-on experience in London, throughout the country, and including overseas, reaching out to many of the marginalized in society those in greatest need, those most vulnerable, the poorest, the homeless. And then many of you will have seen, no doubt, on television, ITV, BBC, GM TV, Breakfast Television, Songs of Praise, early Sunday morning. Time and time again, God has opened the door and given Steve unprecedented opportunities to present the gospel or just to be there, bringing common sense wisdom to people who are in need. And I want you to, some of you, to promise me that you will pray on a regular basis for Steve. God has opened a remarkable window of opportunity to him. They've now set up a new ministry called Oasis Media and they're in the process of actually beginning to make programs and sell them to the new TV companies and uh, he needs all the support and encouragement that he can get in that. I'm going to ask you right now if you join me in prayer and as I pray some of you may be prompted to make a note in the back of your minds or in your Bibles to pray regularly for Steve and Cornelia and their family, that God would protect them and guide them and open many more windows of opportunity for Steve and many others like him. Let's pray, shall we? God, we thank you for Steve. We thank you that he's an ordinary bloke, but he relies on an extraordinary God, and you have done extraordinary things in him and through him, and we give you thanks for that. And we pray now a continued prayer of protection on him and Cornelia in the whole entertainment industry of which most of us have no real inkling what it's like to stand in there and be salt and light and be an, an effective witness, be a sweet-smelling savor and a testimony to Christ as he is. Thank you for him. Strengthen him. Give him continued wisdom and courage. And bless him now as he comes to preach your word to us. Let's give him a big gaiety, spring harvest, friendly, Christian, Baptist, and other denominations welcome. Come on. Thank you. Uh, it's this way. Thank you very much indeed. I was glad to hear when it was mentioned that I was a Baptist, that there are some Baptists here. Yeah. Yes, that's it. There's not many of us, right? Uh, some of you are quiet Baptists, are you? Do we have any quiet Baptists? Let's have a show of uh, and count for the Baptists again. Yeah. That's right. Now, I was just saying to some people this morning, what should you be if you're not a Baptist? Ashamed. That's what you should be. <laughs> Ashamed of yourselves. Get it right next time. Now, I actually, uh, I don't know how many, where you've come from. Uh, you look as though you travelled uh, a long way. Do we have anyone from uh, Scotland or anything like that? Travel down, yes! That's it, Wales? Yeah, a few people. Uh, let me tell you, I come from Croydon. Oh, you come. Has, has anybody else come from Croydon? All right, who's ever been to Croydon? Hey! Who's been more than once? <laughs> oh, as you know, Croydon 
Well, there's a lot of things about Croydon that are worth missing, aren't they? Like the one-way system, the terrible congestion. It's a, just an awful kind of a mess of a place, architecturally, really. But a Croydon is a wonderful place. I was born in Croydon. I support Crystal Palace Football Club. Someone needs to. And, um, no, I, I, I live in Croydon. And you may come from a nicer part of the country. In fact, I can see that a lot of you are sitting there thinking, you know, feeling very sorry for me, writing down that you are going to pray for me now that <laughs> you know I live in Croydon. But um, you ought to know this. Croydon has a lot going for it that your place doesn't. You might live in the Cotswolds. You might live somewhere really countrified. You may live in rambling hills, in wonderful parkland, in a wonderful provincial town. But I tell you what, Croydon has got something you haven't. <laughs> Excuse me? What is it then? All right, I'll tell you what we've got that you've not. Where do you come from? Where? Worthing. Worthing? God. <laughs> I'll tell you what we've got that you've not got. What we have got in Croydon that you've not got in Worthing is this. We are actually in the Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> Worthing is not in the Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> Croydon is in the Oxford Dictionary. We, in fact, we are one of the only towns in Great Britain that has its name in the Oxford Dictionary. Not, not all editions, but the newest editions of the Oxford Dictionary have uh, Croydon in. It's not actually our name, but we've given our name to a term, which is Croydonisation. Have you heard the term Croydonisation? Well, Croydonisation is a new term in the latest edition of the Oxford Dictionary, but, and if you look up the meaning, the definition of Croydonisation, it actually means the architectural ruin of a town centre. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So that's what we've got that worthy hasn't, you know. Anyway, it's, um, it's great to be stood behind this uh, Perspex uh, thing. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of uh, uh, humming around here, isn't there? Kind of, can you hear lots of noises, or is it just me out of the foldback? Just me. Yeah, right. You know, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, the thing is, we are here at Spring Harvest because we want God to speak to us. And Lyndon has just said that over these nights uh, in the Gaiety Theatre, we're going to be looking at this letter that Paul wrote to his friends, Christian friends, in the city of Ephesus. They were friends of his. He'd seen them become Christians. He nurtured them. And now he's writing to them with practical advice, practical guidance to keep them on the right track. And so it's great that we, ourselves, can look at this passage, look at this book, and uh, allow God to speak to us in a clear way. It's wonderful when God speaks to you clearly. It's wonderful God, when God speaks to you directly. And, um, you know, I grew up, as I said uh, earlier, I grew up in a Baptist church. And uh, in a lot of Baptist churches in the olden days, the, you know, the good old days when I was a kid, God never said anything particularly directly to anyone. Uh, well, not at, at my local church, but things have changed. And the different denominations have got together and learnt from one another. And actually, I'm, um, I'm really pleased because I've got a lot of friends that go to new churches. You know, uh, charismatic churches uh, where God really speaks to people in a very direct way. Do you know, it's incredible, isn't it? And, you know, that's crept into our church traditions. It's fantastic. Well, the other month, just before Christmas, I was speaking uh, at a conference with Noel, who, uh, who sat back there, and his band, who'd been playing this evening. And it was incredible, because they come from a new church background. You know, God speaks to them every week. You know, it's fantastic. <laughs> so, uh, wonderful place to belong, isn't it? So there I am. I'm just going to go on to speak. It was, in, uh, it was in Eastbourne, quite near Worthing, actually. And... Uh, so, <laughs> And there we are, I'm just going on to preach, and Noel's a great guy, so he gathers around me with his mates, the band, you know, they're praying for me, kind of little rugby scrum thing, you know, we're all there, and uh, they're praying away, praying away, praying away, and I know that, you know, the Lord often gives them a direct word, you know, for, for them now. So at the end, you know, I'm hungry for God to say something to me, because I'm feeling a little bit nervous, intimidated, in fact, 
And Bradley, who's here, there he is at the back, you know. Let's stand up, Bradley. Let them see you. This man of God. Oh, there he is. Right. Yeah, give him a round of applause. Bradley, he, you know, as we come out this, he puts his hand on my shoulder. He said, Steve, I have something I must tell you. And I thought, oh, great. Lord, what are you going to say? You're going to say you're going to use me like you've never used me before. Are you going to say that I'm special to you? Are you going to say that I'm chosen? What is it? So I said, what is it, Bradley? And he said, your flies are undone. (laughs) It's great when the Lord speaks directly, isn't it? Especially on a night like tonight with one of these. (laughs) Dead handy. Anyway, let's, uh, that, uh, Lyndon read that passage of Ephesians to us. I'd like us to reread one verse of it again. So I'd like you to open your Bible if you've shut it. And we're going to read uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. And this verse, it seems to me, sums up this passage, which is ca- quite complicated, quite complex. But this verse is right at the heart of it and sums up what the passage is about. In my Bible, the whole passage is headed, made alive in Christ. And that's what this verse is about. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. I'll read it again and think about this. But God, because of his great love for us, um, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Like I've just said, Paul had been involved in the beginning of this church in Ephesus. Uh, the book of Timothy, you know the two books of Timothy, um, you know, Timothy 1 and 2? Timothy was the man who in the end led the church in Ephesus, and when Paul writes those letters to Timothy, he's writing to the leader of this particular church. So Paul was very concerned about the Christians in Ephesus. They mattered to him, he'd been there at the start of the church, he'd seen it into life, he'd sent Timothy there, he wanted them to grow in their faith. But things had gone wrong. You see, some of the people who'd become Christians had become Christians from a Jewish background where they'd been under the law and they'd been into Jewish traditions and Jewish festivals and it was do this and do that and do this and do that and sacrifice this and be at that meeting and be at that meeting, be at that ceremony and that festival and that's how you earn your salvation. You've got to be circumcised, you've got to go through the whole bit and you are, will be acceptable to God. And so some of the Christians who'd accepted that God loves us freely were actually slowly getting dragged back into a kind of legalism where they had to do this and they had to do that and they all went around feeling sober and guilty the whole of the time. And so it's that, that situation that Paul is addressing. And he says this, we're going to look at this verse bit by bit. He says, but because of his great love for us, God who's rich in mercy made you alive in Christ. You see, he's telling them you are alive in Christ. But let's look at this phrase by phrase. It says firstly, but because of his great love for us. It's quite an incredible thing, ladies and gentlemen. But if you were to wander down Skegness High Street tomorrow morning, and you were to go into the Wimpy Bar or the... McDonald's or whatever it is here, and you were to approach the first person you sat, uh, saw sat there, and you were to say to them, what message do you believe about God? When you think about God, who do you think about? What's he like? What's the church told you about God? What's the big message the church is sending you? Or, If when you leave Spring Harvest and you get back to your office or you're standing outside the school gates or whatever it is, you're with your next door neighbor who's not a Christian, you say, what's the big thing the church is saying about God? What will people say? The truth is that every single one of us in this building tonight knows that the message people have about God is that God is a judge. God doesn't like me. 
a man said to me just last week, he said, Steve, you don't know how bad I am. I couldn't be a Christian. I'm not the kind God's interested in. It's too late for me. God wouldn't want me. I'm not, the, I'm not good enough. God wouldn't be interested in me. God knows what I'm like. It's too late. God must be angry with me. God wants people better than me. How many times have you heard people say that kind of thing? Hundreds and hundreds. It is the popular belief out there. There's a problem in that. Because when you stop to think about it, I'll ask you a question. If there was one thing you could say, if it was your dying seconds, if you only had one phrase that you could push home, if you were falling from a hundred-story tower block and on your way down past the 52nd floor, the window was open, you had a chance to shout something in about God, what would it be? What would it be? You'd say, God is... God is love. You don't sound very convinced, I might add. <laughs> Mind you, you wouldn't be 50 floors down, would you? Let's just repeat that. God is love. God is love. We believe that, don't we? Well, I want to ask you a question. If we believe that God is love, if that's the one thing we want to communicate to the world, if that at core is who God is, God is love, how come the world believes that God's a judge? How come the big world believes that God doesn't like us? How come the world believes, your next door neighbour believes, your working mates believe that I'm not good enough for God, I, you know, I'm just not up to scratch? How come if the whole message is God is love, we've managed to send the opposite one? It's quite incredible, isn't it? And it's no good us saying, oh, well, it's not our fault, you know. It's nothing to do with us. We've been to, oh, no, 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 no. Let's not get away with that one. There's no smoke without fire. We have somehow succeeded in not only miscommunicating about God, but we communicated the direct opposite of what we wanted to. We believe in a God who it says, because of his great love for us, God is love. But we are meeting on a Butlin site where the guys that work for Butlins believe God isn't love or he doesn't love them or he's not interested in them. Where the town where we meet believes God doesn't love it, is not interested in them. In a nation that believes God's not interested and Christianity is about rules and regulations and it's repressive. What has gone wrong? It's something to do with who we are. And we need to stop and ask ourselves some serious questions. Um, just over a week ago, a week and a little bit ago, I had the, what was a privilege, it was a privilege uh, uh, to conduct a memorial service. And it was for a man called Matthew Harding. Matthew Harding was the vice chairman of Chelsea Football Club. He, um, and he died in a helicopter crash uh, last October. You will remember it dominated the news. He died with four of his friends, uh, three of his friends and the pilot and himself. And uh, Matthew was somebody I knew. I'd known him for a couple of years because I'd actually written in, a, uh, in, a, in, in the Daily Mail, actually, about family life. And um, his friend and then he, they'd been in touch with me and I'd started meeting them, sitting down. We were talking together on a regular basis about families and all the rest of it. And we were getting somewhere. And I'd advised him to find time in his life to pray, as I had his best friend. Time in their lives to pray. So what they used to do is sneak along to a little church, well, a big church actually, quite near where they worked. They'd sneak into this church over lunchtime. They'd just sit there and pray. Now, Matthew would, was the first person to tell you, if he was here tonight, he'd tell you, you know, my business life's going great. It was worth 200 million pounds. 200 million pounds at the last count. And, um, but he'd also add, because very honest bloke, he'd say, but Steve, he'd, say, he'd look at you all and he'd say, but my personal life, what a mess. It's in a mess. And that's why I was encouraging him to spend time, to sort things out. Well, tragically, his life was ended by this helicopter crash. And his friends approached the church where he'd been going to sit and pray and listen sometimes to some of the preaching for a, to hold a memorial service. 
The church wrote back and they said, Matthew Harding was not a godly man, not a Christian man. No one who lived the life that he lives deserves the church to stand alongside him and taint itself by allowing themselves to be matched with him. There is no way that Matthew Hardin will ever, ever be given the tributes of a Christian memorial service at our church. I sat a couple of days after that was, letter was written with Matthew's colleagues and friends, one or two of whom are Christians, most of whom are struggling to find Christ as they tell you if they were here, most of whom, and well, some of whom had sat in that church with Matthew. I sat in an office with them as they wept over that letter. I sat in an office with them as they wept over those words. And let me tell you that that church was an evangelical church. Bible-believing, tub-thumping, good news-bringing Christians. We are evangelicals and we are bringing good news to you. And the good news is God doesn't like you much. Isn't it incredible? Isn't it incredible, ladies and gentlemen, that so often we declare that we are evangelicals, but evangelical means good news bringer. It means that I bring something into your life that you do not have, and the biggest message of all is that God likes you. God loves you. God begins where you are, and he moves with you down the road. But so often we reject people. I have to tell you this. Over the last few years, because of the, thing, the opportunities that God has given me, I don't know how long they will last or not, but because of the opportunities God has given me at this moment, I've got to know probably more people who are not yet Christians than any time in my life before. I've always known loads, but I know the majority of the people I spend the majority of my time with now wouldn't call themselves Christians. I have to say this that I do not know personally, you, you may see this differently, I do not know personally of anyone over the age of 30 who is not on a spiritual journey. You see, once you've lost someone you love, once you've woken up to the fact that you're mortal and you're going to die, once, once you've hit tragedy, once you've been made redundant, once you've had the sack, once your career is up in the air and you don't know where you're going, once your marriage has been threatened, once one of your children has been ill, once you discover that you're on your own and you don't know how to live with tomorrow, once you've been bereaved, once you've been through tragedy, you wake up and you're spiritually searching. We live in a world, a country that's stuffed full of people struggling to find gods. But so often as evangelicals, we draw the divide. You're out and we're in. We count everyone out until they leap in publicly. But what we need to do, ladies and gentlemen, is go to people in God's name with God's love and include everybody in until they jump out. Because that's what Jesus did. And some of us will say, oh, no, 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 no. Jesus was angry. Jesus showed his scorn. Jesus talked about hell. Who did he do that to? It was the religious leaders. It was the Pharisees. That's who Jesus' scorn and anger was for. His love was for the person caught in adultery. His love was for the outcast, the tax collector, the man that didn't matter. How much good news do we offer to the world? The church, the indisputable proof that God is love, is that true of your local fellowship? Is that true of your life? Is it true of who I am? I don't know anyone who's not on this spiritual journey. Are we picking them up? In fact, a, a, a friend of mine uh, who, uh, who um, was involved in the church that turned down Matthew Harding's um, memorial service, he said to me afterwards, and I know Matthew wasn't a Christian because my men witnessed to him and he rejected Christ, 
And I said to my friend, it was probably because your men witnessed him that he did reject Christ. Do you see, so often we come fighting instead of loving. We come and bring us a good news, and if you don't like it, you've had it. When we should come loving and caring. Let's read on. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. God who is rich in mercy. Because of his God, great love, God who is rich in mercy. Now that term, rich, is a very important term. You know, I, I was um, explaining to some people this morning that um, I spent quite a lot of time grappling with the Bible. You know, I went to theological college where they study Greek. And that term, uh, rich in Greek, is a really interesting one. In fact, um, at the college I went to, um, which was in South London, it trained Baptist ministers, they, um, there, were, there were three kinds of students. There were the really bright and clever ones. You can tell I'm not one of those. And they used to, they, they did what was called an honours degree. And in their honours degree, what they did was they used to grapple with the Greek text of the New Testament. They used to learn Greek and then they used to translate into English so they could take God's word in its original language and, in, and translate it so it could be understood. Brilliant stuff. And then there were the next lot of students, the kind of average, you know, pretty clever, but average ones. They didn't grapple with the Greek and translate it. What they did is they started with the English text, you know, like the NIV, and they interpreted it. They understood, they delved into it. They, they, they struggled with each word and they mined out its meaning and they could interpret it. And then there were the students like me. We didn't start with the Greek text and translate it, and we didn't start with the English, English NIV and, um, and interpret, it. interpret it. We started with the Good News Bible, which has a lot of pictures in. <laughs> and we coloured them in. Now. <laughs> oh, yes. So you are looking at a biblical scholar who spent three years colouring in the pictures in the, in the Good News Bible. I know my New Testament. And you might say, well, why did it take three years? The answer is there are a lot of pictures in the Good News Bible. And they're all line drawings. I can't tell you the number of crayons I've used. This word rich in Greek, what it's talking, it's a multi-dimensional word. At uh, God's love, uh, God, let me read this again. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, the word rich is multi dimensional. It's tall and it's high and it's wide. It's three dimensional, four dimensional. It's not, rich doesn't mean just long, it means deep as well. God's love, God's love is as long and as deep and as broad as you can possibly imagine. God's love includes everyone. Just um, a week ago as well, I, I was um, at a reception. This was a reception at an event where most people weren't Christians. It was a media kind of lunch. And uh, I was standing around uh, chatting with people, and uh, this man wanders across to me, and uh, I'd spoken at this so they knew I was a Christian, you see. I'd spoken at this event. He wanders across to me. He must have been in his late 50s, and uh, starts talking, and... Uh, he uh, starts telling me about his life. He's very posh, but he starts telling me about his first wife. And then he told me about his second wife. And then he told me about his third wife that he really preferred. You know, kind of so, uh, you know, so he rambles through this w these women and this, this story about uh, his, his um, marriages and his affairs and relationships in between and the twisted relationships with the kids from the different marriages and things like that. It was a really awful story. And then he said, uh, he said, well, what do you do? And well, he knew I was a minister. So I, I said, well, you know, I'm involved with social care, you know, because we run some hostels and we work with the poor and work with teenagers. You know, I was trying to start where he was, but I was thinking, oh, this guy's got his life's in a state, you know. And then he said, well, what else do you do? So I said, well, I was trying to think of something else. You know, I said, 
Well, we're kind of working in other countries around the world, and we, we, you know, we run employment projects for people. I thought, oh, yeah, that's something good. You know, that's something a striker called with him. And so I went through things, and then he said, well, what else do you do? And in the end, I was running out of things, you know, to say, and, then, and I didn't have anything else to say, so I had to come clean about it. I said, well, actually, we train some people that we call evangelists. You know, I said, you won't understand that term, but we train people we call evangelists, and then we train them to plant churches. Funny term, isn't it? But it means start churches. And do you know what he said? He said, oh, I know all about that. He said, I work for a church plant myself. I said, you, you what? He said, oh, yeah, you see, he said, all that stuff I was telling you about before, the three wives and the affairs and the tangled, twisted relationships with my kids and them going off the rails and ended up in drugs and in jail and everything like that. He said, if you lived a life like that, what would you do? He said, I went down to my local Methodist church one Sunday morning. I sat in the back and I called out to God and said, God, my life is a stake. Will you reach into it? I'm old. I've lived my life. I've messed it up. Will you forgive me? And he said, you know something? God forgave me. Isn't that incredible? God forgave me. And he said, and now we, we, our church is great. He said, we've started a new church. So I'm actually involved in the church plant. It's going very well. He said, I'm in charge of some of the youth work. I can't believe it. Do you see what I'm saying? God's love is rich, deep and long. Don't give up on people. Work with people closely. Care for them. Love them. You know, we always say, don't we, now is the day of salvation. This is the only time to receive the Lord. Of course that's true, and that's what the Scripture tells us about that urgency. But life is also a long thing. Life is also a long thing. I, I worked for, as a youth worker for many years, and I discovered that some of the kids who wandered furthest away have actually come closest to the Lord now. There are people working at Spring Harvest on this site here, and on the other one down in Minehead, who were in my youth group. And they're now, you know, they're speaking and they're holding all sorts of responsibility. And I could tell you what they were like and how far they wandered and how tense I was about it. But life is a long thing. And the Lord's love is very rich. And he reaches in. It may be that you're a mom or a dad here and you're so worried about your child, your teenager in their 20s or 30s and they're so far away from the Lord. Life is a long thing and the Lord's love is very rich. He reaches out. But what we've got to be in our churches is remembering we're in touch with everybody else's kids and everybody else's relations and everybody else's family. So let's Reach out with God's love. Bringing people in, beginning where they are. God's love is a rich thing. There's a church near to where I live. I drive past it every night, actually, uh, pretty well on the way home if I go into the office. It's a big evangelical church. And it's got a board outside that's painted. It's painted permanently, this board. It's not one of those notices that gets changed every, you know, seven days, uh, seven prayerless days makes one week and all of that kind of stuff. It's painted there, and I've lived in, I've lived in this present house where we live for five years, and this notice has been there all, all, uh, all the way through. Every night I drive past it, and this big board says, absolutely true, it says, the wages of sin is death. What a great message. <laughs> I'm driving home. I've got a burden day. Things aren't going very well. My wife doesn't like me. My kids don't like me. They're getting on my nerves as well. But isn't it great to know? God says to me, the wages of sin is death. They've even cut off the good news bits. <laughs> and why have they cut it off? Because we're evangelicals and we've got to stand for godly standards. We've got so much learning to do, ladies and gentlemen. When the world looks at us and says, God's not interested in us, that is a comment on how we have conducted ourselves and how we have explained the Bible and God to the world around us. I'm running out of time, so let's move on. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead, um, in transgressions. 
God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. What does that mean? Well, let's deal with it the other way around. We were made alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Let's start with the being dead in transgressions. Um, about nine months ago, I suppose it was, I was, on, um, I, I was asked to do a phone-in program for Five Live, you know, Radio 5 in the mornings. So on I went, it, it started at 8 and it ran through to 9.30. In between the news and the weather and all of those bits and pieces, there was this ongoing debate between me, uh, b between me and the girl that presents Five Live in the mornings, her name's Diane. And, um, and what happens was, I sit in there, I got to know her a little bit in the few minutes before we went on air. She's from Northern Ireland, she's a wonderful lass, and we got talking. I was there because they said I was a vicar on TV. So, we get talking, and it's going great in between all the different uh, phone calls and the bits of news and weather. And then she, gets, she says to me halfway through in a lovely Irish accent, which I can't imitate at all, she says, but Steve, she says, everyone knows that Christianity is just a load of do's and don'ts and God doesn't like people. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yes. She said, the Bible's just full of do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. And I said, are you really sure? And she said, yeah, I am. And I said, well, do you know, it's strange, I've never noticed that. And she said, yes, it is. She said, for instance. I said, oh, yeah, give us a for instance. She said, it says, do not commit adultery. There was a long pause, and I said, no. <laughs> no. It doesn't say that, does it? She said, yes, it does, and you know it does. <laughs> I said, no, I don't. Just repeat it to me. She said, it says, do not commit adultery. I said, do you know something? I've been a Christian a long time. I, I just can't remember that one. It's, uh, are you sure it's in there? She said, don't be funny with me. She said, it's in there twice and you know it. I grew up in Sunday school, she said, in Northern Ireland. I know it's in there twice. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Do not commit adultery. And I said, ah, oh, that's what you mean. I said, do you know something? That's not what it says at all. She said, don't be stupid, of course it's what it says. I said, oh no, it doesn't say that, you've missed the point. She said, well, what does it say then? I said, well, at the end of this interview, Diane, as I walk out of here, I can say, I really love being here today, or I really love being here today. And I said, I'll be using the same words, but the same words to mean a completely different thing. I said, you know, it doesn't say, do not commit adultery. It says, do not, don't commit adultery. Don't commit adultery, because if you do, you'll really screw your life up. Don't commit adultery, because it's deadly. It'll destroy you. It'll cut you down. It'll take away your relationships. It'll eat into your family. It, it will eat into the, your society and corrode it. Don't commit adultery. And she said, are you sure? <laughs> and I said, yes, I am. And I said, actually, if you listen to the Ten Commandments, because it's one of those, they're prefaced by God saying, listen. I am your God. I brought you out of slavery, you, you Israelites. You were slaves. You were brick makers. You were nothing. I brought you out of slavery. I've set you free. I'm the best deal you can get. I love you in a world where no one else even knows you. I love you. So, don't have any gods before me. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't commit adultery because these things will just break life down for you. And she looked at me, a long pause, and she said, do you know, I never ever knew that. And I said, yeah, it's like this. God didn't look down at all the things we like doing. You know, ah, adultery, they like doing it. Right, I'll outlaw that then. Gluttony. Gluttony is symbol. 
And what else can I outlaw? God didn't look down in an arbitrary way at everything we like doing and outlaw it for the sake of doing it. No, God in his tears and his love looked down on a world that he created and he said, don't do these things. You know, the monks had seven deadly sins. Lust being one of them, gluttony being another, sloth being another. They kind of listed sins that God talked about in the Old Testament and New Testament. And why do they call them the deadly sins? Because they're deadening, they're destructive, they tear us apart, they drain us of life. And this lass looked at me and she said, I can see it now. At that moment, the phone rang. It was a Christian on the phone line. They put him on air. He came on air and he said, I am an evangelical Christian and I just want to say, I've never heard anything so bad as that Reverend Steve Chalk saying, get him off, get him off. Sin is sin and we need to name it as such. Afterwards, I talked to her. I said, I don't blame that guy. I don't blame him for saying what he said because he's just so badly taught. He doesn't know. He thinks sin is sin because sin is sin because God, for some reason, doesn't like it. For no reason doesn't like it. No, sin is sin because God loves us and he looks at us and he sees everything that takes us, drains life from us, and he says, don't do this. Sin isn't sin because it just happens to be sin. Sin is sin because it's destructive and a God of love can't bear to look at his creation but having life drained away from them. We were dead in our transgressions. What does that mean? It simply means we messed our lives up and the result and the fruit of that is not only seen in our lives but in the whole of society's life. But it says this. It says this. Though we were dead in our sins, we were made alive in Christ. What does that mean? And with this, I close. I was doing a, uh, a phone-in program again for, for GMTV one day, and it was about marriage. And, uh, and I, I, there was some advice, you know, I was sat there on the settee, and a lady rang in, and her marriage wasn't going very well. And I sat there with a big smile and looked into the camera as you're supposed to. I said, now what you've got to do, Audrey, or whatever her name is, you need to, what you've got to do is you've got to communicate with your husband. You know, work at telling him, uh, telling him how you feel about him. Communication is the key to a strong relationship. The phone was put down, everybody around in the studio said, oh, great advice, Steve, great advice, Steve, wonderful advice. I went up, the production manager said, oh, great advice, great advice. I got up into um, the offices and the phone rang. And on the phone, there was a little old lady who I've never spoken to before and never spoken to again. I picked up the phone and she said, hello, Steve. I said, hello. She said, I've just been listening to you on the television. I said, oh, thank you. She said, you're very good, you know. I said, oh, thanks, thanks. She said, but you're completely wrong. And I said, what? What, what do you mean? And she said this. She said, you told that lady that communication was the key to keeping her marriage together. It's not. The key is forgiveness. And that is the key. The key is forgiveness. You see, if in my marriage I communicate with Cornelia, my wife, and I communicate my long list of complaints about the way she let me down over the last 16 years, and she communicates back her calendar of, well, on our second wedding anniversary, you didn't even buy me a card, which incidentally is true, but there you are. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just she keeps reminding me of it. And I've bought her a card every year since. Well, actually, it's the same one. I can't read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but do you see what I mean? If all you communicate is your list of failures, you're lost. What matters most is forgiveness. What matters most is forgiveness. We need forgiveness. We need forgiveness. You know, marriage is, is it's like this, isn't it? You know the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, fairy story. What happens is, princess sees frog, princess kisses frog, frog turns into prince, prince and princess get married and live happily ever after. You know the story, don't you? But you know in real life it's not really like that in marriage. What happens is, princess sees frog, frog temporarily changes into prince, Princess marries Prince. Prince turns back into frog. That's what happens. That's right. 
and then the princess is stuck with him for the next 35 years. The frog who sits there every morning, who's there every night, who doesn't communicate, who just grunts away in the chair. <laughs> That's the problem. That is the problem, and it's the other way round as well. And you know, don't you, ladies and gentlemen, whether you're married or whether you're single, whatever the situation is, you know that the worst feeling in the world, I talk about being married, but, but it applies to everyone. You know, I know as a husband, the worst feeling in the world isn't actually when Cornelia reminds me that I'm a frog, as she does very often. The worst feeling in the world is when she doesn't tell me I'm a frog, but I know I'm a frog. Isn't that true? Isn't the worst feeling when you know you are not the person you long to be? You're not the father, you're not the husband, you're not the wife, you're not the daughter, you're not the son, you're not the workmate, you're not the colleague, you're not the preacher, you're not the leader, you are not the person that you long to be and you know you are a frog. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why this book and this verse that we read and this passage is so wonderful. Because if the Bible was just, well, don't do this and live like that. And don't commit adultery because it you know, will really screw your life up. That's true and that's right. And it's written by a loving God who doesn't write out of anger, but writes out of mercy. But if it was only self-help, now live like this and do that, we'd be lost. The truth is, at the heart of this book is a message of forgiveness. We were dead in our transgressions, but we have been made alive because Jesus, God's Son, gave his life on a cross for us. That's what separates this book from every other self-help book you will ever read. I don't know if you're like me, but I'm addicted to self-help books. I need to be. You know, I've got self-help management books. I've got self-help uh, daily planning books, time management books. I've read books on being a dad and being a this and being a that and everything else. I've read books on typing and word processing and understanding Windows 95. <laughs> and, and all they do to you is depress you. Isn't that true? <laughs> Who has ever read a self-help book that didn't feel half the person they were when they started reading it? I read a book on understanding Windows 95 and I want to throw my whole computer away as a result. I read a book on planning my time and all I feel is guilty that I'm wasting all of my time. When we read about self-help, all it convinces us of is that we have failed. This is not a self-help book. It's a God's help book. It's about how God reaches in and he says, I know you can't be what you so long to be. I know you can't be what you dream of being. So I have sent my son so that you might know forgiveness for being a frog. You might know forgiveness for your failure and you might live again. Ladies and gentlemen, I've taken all my time up. I, whoa, I, I clo <laughs> I've taken all my time up. I close by saying these two things in two sentences. One, if you are a person who's always felt guilty, who's always felt that you don't matter, who's always felt that you've let God down, know this, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, sent Christ so that when we were dead in our sins, we could be forgiven. You may feel a frog, but here at Spring Harvest tonight, in this Gaiety Theatre tonight, you can know God's forgiveness, not because you deserve it, but because God is love. That was, thank you for that one statement. The other statement is this. If you are a Christian who has been selling in the name of God an evangelical gospel that says get yourself right and get yourself sorted out because the wages of sin is death, repent of that. Turn your back on that attitude and say to God, I'm going to be good news. Good news to my husband, good news to my wife, good news in my family, good news in my workplace. I'm going to be there. I'm going to love people. I'm going to start out where they are, not shoving Christianity down their throats, but by being a friend for them, by being where they are and drawing them to Christ. Every man or woman you meet is on a spiritual journey and you will either help them closer or you will drive them back. I have a very good friend who is, uh, I have a very good friend who one of his relatives is a very well-known 
Christian leader who believes in the Bible and we've got to proclaim it and we've got to read it and it must always be open and we must expound the scripture. And my friend would tell you this, tell you this through pain and has recounted it to me many times. The only reason why no one else in the wider family of this man is a Christian is because of him. Nationally, he proclaims the good news. We've got to stick to the Bible, the be Bible believing, and we don't want any of this mucking around jolly stuff. <laughs> and actually, he has driven his entire family from Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, God has loved me and you and dealt with us generously. Let's learn to love a world in need of Christ's love and deal with them generously. God bless you. We're going to stand and we're going to sing number six, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. Let's stand and sing. God has addressed us and I have a message for frogs it's a very simple one if tonight you have never met Jesus you've never discovered what it means to have the love of God coming and flooding your life and filling your life and transforming your life then I want to ask you just to walk away from your seat and to walk to one of those two exit doors and from now, everyone passing through those exit doors will be led by our pastoral team members who are there. Just down into the bar. I'm sorry. That is the facility we have available. And there, our friends, are going to be just available to talk with you, pray with you, and bless you. And take frogs and make them princes and princesses. Because that's what the Christian message is about. Many of you have come to Spring Harvest knowing in your heart that you wanted to find something. You wanted to find a God who is real. And you've got this idea that by the end of the week you might just about be ready. Well, by the end of the week you'll have wasted it, won't they, Noel? Because the week is there for you to meet Jesus tonight, to grow in Jesus this week, and to go home a different person. And if tonight those words as Steve has preached of a God who loves you, cares for you, and died for you. If you want to meet that Jesus tonight, then just quietly make your way as we sing to those two exit doors. Otherwise, if you are a frog who has not been the kind of Christian that you know you should have been, maybe you've been hot on the condemnation of others, or maybe you've just been lacking in love for God in your own life, and you'd like to get clear and clean tonight that you may grow in God this week, then as we sing, would you make your way to the exit doors? We'll just be guided into the bar. Some of our own team are making their own way off the platform now to do just that. And to lead you quietly into the love and the joy and the peace of Jesus again. As we sing, God has spoken tonight. If this is the longing in your heart, as you make your way through those doors, we'd love to meet with you and pray with you. Noel will lead us. Let's sing that second verse together. God's grace first taught my heart to feel. God's grace first taught my heart to feel. His grace my fears will Yeah. 
simple we're going to be concluding in just a few minutes when we finish singing we're going to pray you're going to go but if tonight you've never met Jesus but you want to find him tonight find him as your lover your Lord and your friend then you'll find him just like that I want to ask you while we sing not to leave it for tomorrow or the rest of the week but just to quietly go now to one of those exit doors you may say I can't it's too long a walk talk to the person next to you. I'll grab them and ask them if they'll go with you, and they will. If you've got uh, a husband or a wife, a partner, a friend, and you need to talk to them, you just do it. Because tonight there's nothing more wonderful than people meeting Jesus. And if you know the Lord already, and that love is not what it should be tonight, you know you've been a frog. To your parents, to your, to your husband or wife, to your friends, to your church. You know there are things wrong. I'm, not, I'm going to ask you not to wait till tomorrow or another night. I'm going to ask you right now tonight just to make your way to those exits. To go down and just to sit and talk and pray with someone. Set it right with God. Come back to Him. You never met Jesus? Start moving. You want to come back to Him? Start moving. You just walk as we sing to those exit doors. And we'll guide you down. Just move now as God speaks to your life. Lord, touch people right now with your love and your grace. Move them with your power. Help us, Lord Jesus, not to wait for you to drag us screaming back to you. And help us tonight just quietly to make that commitment of our lives to you. Help us to have the courage to move. In Jesus' name, amen. You move as we're singing. Just those exit from